Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here, and I'm sure we have a lot of folks traveling on this Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and so if you're watching online via the live stream, we are thankful for technology. Glad you can join us by way of the internet. If you're a visitor here this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you've joined us for worship. We hope that you'll join us again in the future. Several announcements uh, before we begin our service. Uh, first, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, for a week off and a Sunday off last Sunday. And thanks to Elder Jamie Dagenhart for preaching. Uh, it was good to have some time away. Uh, but it's always good to be back, and good to be back in the pulpit. Uh, so we'd thank you for that. I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving, whether you traveled or whether you stayed here, whatever it looked like. I uh, hope that it was a good Thanksgiving, and we do have so much for which to be thankful. Several announcements before we begin our service. First is that the poinsettia forms uh, are out on the table outside the vestibule, and those are due today. So if you would like to give a poinsettia in honor and memory of somebody, uh, please fill that out, turn it in. Even if you don't pay today, at least turn it in. Uh, or you can also uh, take care of that online on the church app. Uh, you can even pay for it online. We are moving up in the world of technology. Uh, but this Friday is uh, Christmasville Parade, and our church is doing an event, especially for families, but anyone is welcome. Uh, we'll have a pizza dinner, and then you can set up your chairs early outside here, and the parade comes right uh, by. We have a fellowship. We'll also just kind of welcome folks, uh, invite people to church, invite them to a preschool if we see families, things like that. So it'll be a wonderful uh, event. Again, that's this Friday. I think sign-ups are due by Tuesday. Out on the table, out in the hallway, there are Christmas cards for our missionaries. If you would take just a few moments and write a quick note, you don't have to write one to every missionary. Uh, but if you pick two or three and just tell them you love them, tell them you're praying for them, uh, that goes a long ways. Parents, basketball sign-ups are wrapping up. If you have not signed up your child for basketball, please do so. Uh, ASAP, the basketball season will get ready to start. Uh, for our older kids, it starts before Christmas. For a lot of younger kids, it starts right after Christmas. Um, but we look forward to a wonderful basketball season and uh, pray that the Lord uses that uh, as a blessing in our community. Operation Christmas Child boxes are in the connector on the way to the Fellowship Hall. If you would like to take a box and pack it and uh, bring it back by December the 10th, we'll get those delivered to the processing center but again, a chance to be a blessing to a child somewhere around the world uh, who may not be able to celebrate Christmas like we do. So take a box, maybe take your grandchildren or your children and go pack and bring it back. Lessons and Carols is December the 17th. That's at both services, 9 and 11. Uh, so please take note of that. It's a wonderful chance to invite folks in the community, especially folks that don't have a church home, to come and hear uh, the story of Christmas through song and through the reading of Scripture. So I hope uh, that you will uh, plan to be here for that December the 17th. Lastly, next Sunday begins Advent, which is just kind of hard to believe. Uh, but if you're like me, the, the busyness of the season can be a distraction. Um, and sometimes we highlight various resources. And I want to point out one today. It's called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's a, a liturgy and kind of almost a family worship or a personal worship. Uh, it takes you through some various readings, some scripture readings, singing of some Christmas carols. Uh, it's just a wonderful resource. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with that, I would, uh, you can find it on Amazon or other websites. Uh, but it is a wonderful way to slow down and prepare for Christmas. Several folks to be praying for. Angela Fischester, she's home under hospice care. Continue to pray for her and for Chris and her family. Mardell Nashen, who is uh, one of our newer members who lives at Westminster Tower, she is also under hospice care. Uh, so be in prayer for her. The Lord will provide for her. Mary Robinson is having knee replacement surgery tomorrow. Pray for her that that surgery would go smoothly, her recovery would go well. Uh, and Stephen Turner is having surgery for colon cancer tomorrow as well. So be in prayer for Stephen. The Lord be gracious to him. Uh, surgery would go well and he would uh, begin recovery. Well, brothers and sisters, we're here to worship the Lord. Worship is the verb of the Christian life. It's what God made us to do. And here in corporate worship, we are not passive observers. We're active participants. 
We are here to worship. So take these next few moments as Orlando plays to quiet your heart and to prepare for worship. For our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 28 through 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Our opening hymn will be in our black hymn books. If you'll stand with me, if you can. Hymn number 21.
turn over to number 51. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, number 51. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to worship and adore you. We worship and adore you as individuals and as a congregation. We know that our good deeds cannot earn our salvation, but you have chosen to forgive our sins because we trust in you as our Savior. We are thankful for your continuous presence in our lives. We often forget that without your Spirit at work within us, we would be empty people. Keep us close to you. Keep us in communication with you. We know you can see what's in our hearts. We ask that you remind us of our need to stay close to you. As we worship together this morning, we lift our voices with songs of joy. May we then listen to your word and open our hearts and minds 
to what you desire from us. And most gracious God, we confess, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and our actions by what we have, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the prayer that you taught the disciples as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our assurance of pardon is found from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Come now the time for our children's message. That's kids fifth grade and younger. If you'll come forward and meet me on the front pew for our children's message. All right, y'all slide together. We got some more room. Hollis and Henry, we got room for you. Maybe if you want to sit on the second pew, we got more coming. This is great. Henry, you want to start on the second pew? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, well, I have to reach underneath you, okay? You ready? All right, what is this? A dumbbell, a dumbbell weight. Six pounds. You think this is heavy? No. Who, who can pick this up? Willie, you got this? Show oh, so strong. Yep. Hannah, can you hold it? Ooh, yep. Okay. A couple more. Yeah. All right. Six pounds, not too bad, right? All right, now, 10 pounds. You think so, Ben? You got it? Ooh, okay, yep, good job. Let's see, Cody. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? You got it? Yep, Elliot. Yep, Parker. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Y'all doing great. You think you can hold this 10 pounds? Pretty heavy, two hands. Yeah, there you go. All right, pretty heavy. I got one more. Let's see. If you want 15, I can carry it. 25 pounds. Anybody, anybody brave enough? Yeah. Will you want to try it? Oh, okay, good job. Don't hurt yourself. Ooh, y'all are stronger than I thought. Yep, Elliot. Oh, good job. Hannah, you want to try? Oh, one-handed, that's bold. <laughs> Oh, good job. Okay. All right, now, all right, y'all, y'all are so much stronger than I thought you were. I'm gonna put this back. So we went from six to ten to twenty-five pounds. What if that was a hundred pounds? Do you think you could lift it? No. No, I don't know that I could. What if it was a thousand pounds? No. no, that would be like immovable. Well, in the very last verse. The book of Amos, we are preaching on today, it says, I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them. God is saying that his people have security. They can't be moved. And our hope in that is because of Jesus. Jesus tells us that no one can snatch us out of his hand, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So friends, our hope, our safety it's not in how strong we are. Our hope is in how great our God is. And we can't be moved if your faith is in him. So trust Jesus. Believe in him. Build your life upon Jesus. Love him every day. Because he is so worthy of it. Let me pray. God, I thank you for these boys and girls. I thank you for how 
You've given them physical strength. But Lord, I pray that you would also give them spiritual strength, that they would know you and love you all the days of their life. And Lord, remind them that if their faith is in you, they cannot be shaken, they cannot be moved, no matter what comes their way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you can go back to your seats or to Children's Church. Well, today we are concluding our study of the book of Amos. I'm sure for some of you that comes as a relief. The book of Amos is a challenging book. It's been hard to preach through, uh, but I pray that it's been challenging in a good way. I pray that it has been edifying to your soul if you've been here throughout our series. And I hope that you've seen just how relevant God's word is on our daily life. By way of a reminder, for those visiting with us, we've been working our way through the book of Amos in a series I entitled, Warnings for a Prosperous Age. Amos, as best we can tell, was written around 760 B.C., about 40 years before the northern kingdom of Israel was taken into captivity, and Amos is preaching to the northern kingdom, warning them of coming judgment because of their wicked ways. Our text today is Amos 9, 11 through 15. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me there. If you don't, then uh, it's found on your bulletin insert. It's also found on page 723 of your pew Bible. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, I would love for you to take the one in the pew as our gift to you. In this passage, we'll see how the book of Amos ends on a very positive note. The warnings about coming judgment have been repeated all throughout the book, and it's kind of overwhelming, and we're tempted to be discouraged, but here it ends on a glorious high note. I find the future restoration for the remnant who have remained faithful to God. Before I read this passage, I'm going to pray and ask for the Lord's blessing and his help. Gracious God, you've told us that all scripture is breathed out by you and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Lord, would you open our eyes to see wondrous things in this, your holy word. Speak, Lord, for your servants listen. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Hear now the reading of God's word, Amos chapter 9, starting in verse 11. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them, and shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on the land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. Throughout the centuries, it has long been the desire for many Christians to try to connect biblical passage passages with current events. And I think that's especially true of prophecy, and even more specifically, prophecy regarding kind of end times. Perhaps you've heard uh, that the Bible talks about the Antichrist. And well, throughout the centuries, people have said, who is the Antichrist? Maybe it was the Roman Emperor Nero. Maybe, you know, it was Alexander the Great. Maybe it was Napoleon Bonaparte, maybe it was the Pope, maybe it was Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, and more recently people have said, no, it's Vladimir Putin or it's Donald Trump. There's also a tendency to look at biblical prophecy as a roadmap of the future. And so the question becomes, where are we? 
The war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas has brought this line of thinking back to the forefront. Some of you have asked me, John, are we in the last days? We tend to be very curious about things like this. And then we come to passages like Amos 9, 11 through 15 that kind of seem to speak directly to all of this. I mean, verse 15 says, I will plant them on their lands and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them. A week ago Friday, there was an article on the Rolling Stones website entitled, These Evangelicals Are Cheering the Gaza War as the End of the World. It was an article that covered the march for Israel that happened in D.C. November the 14th. Pastors like John Hagee from Texas came and talked about how the war in Israel is directly connected to biblical prophecy. Well, what are we to make of all that? I said earlier that our passage in Amos 9 seems to speak directly to all of this. And I use that word seems intentionally because I don't really believe it has anything to say to current events, especially what's going on in the Middle East. Perhaps that shocks you. Maybe it relieves you. But either way, I hope that as we walk through this passage, we'll gain a clear understanding of what God's Word actually says and how it relates to our lives. Two weeks ago, we looked at Amos 8, verse 4, through chapter 9, verse 10, (coughs) and we found an an exception. Verse 9 of chapter 9 says, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. The Lord is saying to the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, I'm not going to destroy all of you, even though you're all guilty. I'm going to save a remnant, a small group who have remained faithful to me. But we can imagine this remnant wondering, is God actually going to be faithful to his promise? And it's a promise that goes all the way back to Genesis 17. In verses 4 or 5 of Genesis 17, the Lord tells Abram, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And yet, the kingdom seems like it's about to end. Is God really going to keep his promises? And here in Amos 9, we found, find a resounding yes. God will keep his promises. This passage breaks down into two main sections, verses 11 and 12, and then 13 through 15. And so look at verse 11, how our passage begins. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Well, what in the world does that mean? What is this booth of David? Well, it's going to take a little bit of explanation. Bear with me, but the details are so important for our understanding. In 2 Samuel 7, we find David, the second king of Israel, a godly man, a man after God's own heart, who desires to build a house for the Lord. He wants to build the temple. And it sounds great, and he's excited, but God tells Nathan the prophet, no, David will not. You need to go to David and say, no, It's not going to be your job. You've shed too much blood fighting your enemies. Actually, your son Solomon will build a house for me, a temple. But then in 2 Samuel verse 11, the Lord says, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And then in verse 16, the Lord says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. David wants to build a house for the Lord. But the Lord says, No, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a dynasty, give you a kingdom. The promise was that a king from the line of David would be on the throne of Israel forever. Well, that sounds great. But yet things in Israel aren't so good. And especially in the Amos' day, things are really not good. In Amos 9, we find a promise of restoration, but it's not restoring the house of David, it's restoring the booth of David. What does that mean? Well, a booth was a temporary living structure. Soldiers would live in a booth, they're out on the battlefield. Shepherds lived in a booth out in the field watching their sheep. People of Israel lived in a booth when they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, once a year. 
They were lean-to structures that were flimsy. They were weak. They were temporary places to live. Well, why would Amos talk about the booth of David? Well, there's a couple options. One, it could be to describe the weakness of Israel because the nation's divided. Remember, northern kingdom Israel, southern kingdom Judah. (coughs) And that's very possible. Except that that happened in 931 B.C., almost 200 years prior to Amos preaching. And so more likely is that it's, a, it's kind of a rebuke of the line of David, the kings, not in Israel where Amos is preaching, but in Judah, saying, look, the people of Judah are guilty too, and their kings aren't that great. Uzziah was the king at this time. Think Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah's vision of the throne room. Uzziah was a pretty good king, but still he let false worship remain in Judah. All that to say the house of David, the royal throne, and the kingdom that it represented was in disarray. But God will restore it. Well, that's neat. But when is that day? Oh, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David. When is that day? Well, friends, the good news is that day has already come. How did God raise up the booth of David? He did it through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this prophecy in Amos 9, 11 is all about Jesus. Think of Matthew 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Or think about what the wise men ask in Matthew 2.2, 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And in the Bible, Revelation 17, verse 14, it says of Jesus, he is Lord of lords and king of kings. God restored the booth of David through raising up King Jesus. Jesus is the answer to the desolation of the house of David. And friends, King Jesus is the answer to the problems in our world today. There's so much unrest and turmoil in our world. It's the war in Ukraine. It's the war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Tensions are rising in China, Iran, other places around the world. There's political upheaval in our own country. And next year, we'll have another presidential election cycle. Oh, boy. And there's unrest in each of our hearts as well. We're fearful about the future. We worry about the holiday season. We grieve the loss of family and friends. We face sickness and sorrow all around us. What you and I need is the everlasting reign of King Jesus. And what this means for us is that we are called to surrender to his lordship every day. Now, perhaps you're thinking, John, I've surrendered to Jesus. I'm a Christian. I mean, I'm I'm here today. Well, great. But realize that the call is to surrender to him every day. In every aspect of your life. In your work. In your school. In your recreation activities. In your hobbies. In your friendships. How you interact with your neighbors. What you do in your free time. The lordship of Jesus impacts every aspect of our life, or at least it should. Jesus didn't come to be king of part of your life. He didn't come to be king of part of this church. No, he came to be king over everything. And he is king, whether we recognize it or not, whether we surrender to him or not. And it raises an important question. What part of your life do you struggle surrendering to the lordship of Jesus? Friends, this passage tells us there's a king. But it goes further. Not only does it tell us about a king, it also talks about a kingdom. We see this kingdom in two parts. The first part is in the second half of verse 11 and verse 12. God says that he will repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the old days. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. First glance, it seems like God is going to do some great work in restoring Israel physically. The language sounds like the rebuilding of cities so that the people can live in them like the days of old. 
Then they'll possess Edom, that great enemy, the descendants of Esau. Sounds like the army's going to be restored. Conquer the enemies of Israel. And you know, that's how some people interpret this passage. But I don't believe that's a faithful interpretation. Why? Because it doesn't let the rest of the Bible guide the interpretation. If you have your Bible open, turn over to the book of Acts. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 15. In Acts 15, we find the Jerusalem council, the elders and the apostles have gathered together to talk about the Gentiles, non-Jews, coming into the church. And the big question is, do they need to be circumcised? There's a big discussion, and James, the half-brother of Jesus, stands up. In Acts 15, starting in verse 13, we find this. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, words of the, the, and with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Friends, this is fascinating. James, an apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, quotes Amos 9 in support of what God is doing in the Gentiles. He's basically saying the prophecy of Amos is fulfilled right now, with the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, what God is doing among the Gentiles is what he promised back in Amos 9. The good news is not just for the Jews. And friends, we must see that the New Testament is the only authorized and inspired interpretation of the Old Testament, as one commentator put it. And part of my job as your pastor is to help you be the best Bible students you can be. And to understand the Old Testament, we have to understand it in light of the New Testament, especially when the New Testament directly quotes it, as we find here in Acts 15. So we see James is interpreting Amos 9 to tell us that the Gentiles are being saved. That's what the promise was all about. Edom, that great enemy, will have a remnant saved, just like Israel. Yes, a lot of Edom will be destroyed, but Amos doesn't focus on that. We might think Amos would be cheering. Yes, they're getting what they deserve. Kind of like what Jonah was hoping would happen to Nineveh. Remember, he climbed up the mountain and sat under the tree and waited for God to destroy Nineveh, but it didn't happen. Some of Edom is saved as well as some of all the nations. They will be called by the name of the Lord. Israel possessing them simply means that they will be folded into the kingdom of God. And praise the Lord for that, for as far as I know, every single one of us here today are Gentiles and not Jews. This is good news for us. Brothers and sisters, the fulfillment of Amos 9, 11, and 12 is in the church of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the people of God was the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, The people of God is the church scattered around the world. It's not Israel. It's not America. It's the church. Which means we are to rejoice in this glorious work that God is doing. He's calling a people to himself from all around the world. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, we read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Friends, the King is Jesus, and the kingdom now is the church. It's the good news of salvation for all people. Bible scholar Sam Storm summarizes it this way. He says, The rebuilding of David's tabernacle is a result of his return of God that was inaugurated by the resurrection and exaltation of Christ and is being progressively realized in the gathering of Gentile believers into the covenant people of God. 
Friends, if this is the case, if God is in the business of bringing people into his kingdom, it means we have the responsibility to go and share that message. Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus as Lord? Who can you pray for that God would bring them in? Are you praying for them? Who do you know that you can invite to church? We have the message of salvation. There is no, under name, no other name under heaven by which people may be saved, as Peter says in Acts 4. If we truly understand this message, we'll share it with others. Oh, that we would see people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that we would be used by God to spread this message to people here in Rock Hill who don't know the Lord. The King is Jesus. The kingdom now is the church. But our passage doesn't end there. Look at verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. The phrase, behold, the days are coming, is used four other times in Amos. And each time, it's a warning of judgment. But now it's the promise of blessing. Abundance will come upon the people of God. The plowman shall overtake the reaper. Crops in Israel planted in the month of October, they're harvested in April and May. But in this vision, we see that they won't even be able to plant fast enough to keep up with the harvest. I believe it's symbolic language of just a fruitful abundance that will be true for God's people. In verse 14, we read of God restoring the fortunes of his people Israel. And they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. This seems like physical blessings for the nation of Israel, and many interpret it that way. But I don't think that's the best understanding. Why? Again, we must let Scripture interpret Scripture. In Hebrews 11, we find the Hall of Faith, that passage where over and over again we find various Old Testament saints who were commended for their faith. And in the middle of that, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 13, we find this. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What this tells us is that the promised land of Canaan was never the end goal. It was a type and a shadow of a greater land, a heavenly land, the new heavens and the new earth. Brothers and sisters, the goal is not to get the Jews back to the land of Palestine. Some Christians believe that. It comes from a branch of theology called dispensationalism. It's made popular by the Left Behind movies. But it's inconsistent with Reformed theology and Covenant theology. For you see, at the heart of it, dispensationalism said that there's two people of God, Israel and the church. That's where the rapture comes in. You've got to get the church out so God can God get back to plan A with Israel. Friends, that's not in the Bible. There's always been one people of God. Now, does that mean that there's no hope for the Jews? No, I don't think so. I think it's very possible that many will come to faith. Paul seems to teach this in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, when he says, thus all Israel will be saved. I don't think that means every Jew will be saved, but it's per- perhaps likely that many will come to faith in Christ one day. But the point of Amos 9 is not physical restoration to Palestine for the Jews. It's future blessing fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth when all of God's people are gathered in and spend eternity in the presence of God. That's the future restoration that awaits not just Israel, but all of God's people. In eternity, we will dwell with God and nothing will be able to separate us from his love. Brothers and sisters, this is exciting. This is glorious news. 
In the midst of so much uncertainty in our world, God guarantees a future promise that is secure. Nothing will be able to take this away from us. Nothing will be able to uproot us from the presence of God. This is a promise of stability. Our world longs for stability. Everything seems to be shaking. But God says, you want stability? Look to me and look to what I will bring in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. Notice the last five words of the book of Amos. It says, the Lord your God. There's not a more comforting way for a book of warnings to end. Yes, judgment will come on the wicked. You don't want to be found opposing God. But for those who know and love the Lord, God says, you are my people and I am your God. Friends, do you know the Lord your God? There's a big difference in knowing about him and truly knowing him. I pray that you know him. I pray that he knows you. If you don't know Christ, come to him today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You're not promised tomorrow. Friends, as we bring the sermon and the whole series to a close, we need to see how this prepares us for Advent. What? Advent? I don't see anything talking about Advent here in Amos 9. In Advent, we celebrate Christ's coming. Advent simply means coming. We celebrate the first coming of Christ, the, the second person of the Trinity took on human form, and born in a manger. We look back to the birth of our Savior. But in Advent, we also look forward to his second coming. That day when Christ will come riding on the clouds in triumphant victory to defeat his enemies and to usher in his eternal kingdom. Amos 9 points to both of these advents. The first part of the prophecy was fulfilled in the first advent, the first coming of Christ, and the second part will be fulfilled in Christ's second advent. My guess is you never thought Amos would prepare and pave the way for advent. I didn't really until I'd started digging into this passage. But it does. For you see, Amos is all about Jesus. Remember, the whole Bible is about Jesus. And in Jesus, the hopes and fears of all the years are met. So rest in Jesus. Delight in him. Prepare to celebrate his first coming. Long for his second coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is powerful. And Lord, a passage written some several thousand years ago is so relevant for us here. November 26th, the year 2023. Lord, what a great God you are to provide your word for us that speaks directly to what we face so that we can have hope now and forever. Lord, we praise you that Jesus is king. We praise you that his kingdom right now is the church, and that his kingdom one day will be in the new heavens and the new earth. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord, prepare our hearts to celebrate your first coming and make us long for your second coming. May the things of this earth grow strangely dim, and may we delight in you. We want to pray for our church. We pray that she would be at work. Lord, there are many suffering, going through various trials. Lord, we think of folks under hospice care. Lord, for Angela Fischer and Mardell Nashen. Lord, give them peace that passes all understanding. Prepare them to meet you face to face. And Lord, would they rest in the finished work of Jesus. Lord, for those that have surgery tomorrow, we think of Mary Robinson and Stephen Turner. Lord, bless both of them. Would their surgeries be successful? Would their recoveries be smooth? And Lord, use this to bring growth in both of their lives. Father, I'm sure there are others facing various trials, some that we know about, some that we don't. Would you provide as only you can? For those grieving the loss of loved ones, would you comfort and provide? Lord, remind us that we have so much for which to be thankful. Lord, we pray for our church, that you would help us to be faithful to the mission you've called us in making disciples of all nations. 
Lord, whether that's in the exchange apartments across the streets or around the world through our missions efforts, Lord, would we see people come to faith in Jesus? Give us a bigger picture of your kingdom than we could ever imagine. And Lord, would we see people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to pray for our children and young people. Watch over them and protect them. Lord, keep them from the evil one. Would they know you and love you all the days of their life? Lord, as we enter this Advent season, Lord, help us to enjoy this time. Lord, we not be distracted by material things, but would we delight in spiritual realities. Lord, would our love for you grow, would our faith be strengthened. Pray this all in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We do want to affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find them printed in your bulletin. Please stand if you're able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and our life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of dedication is number 42 in your black notebook, The Solid Rock. Number 42, we'll remain standing and sing together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that Christ is the solid rock, that all other ground is sinking stand. Lord, would we stand firm on Christ, the solid rock? And Lord, would that impact how we live and would it cause us to be generous people, 
As we give back to you, what do we give not reluctantly or out of compulsion, but what do we give cheerfully? And take these gifts and use them for your good purposes. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, remember that God is at work in this world. He's chosen to use his church, which means you and I have a part to play. So go and play your part. Play it faithfully. Play it with God's blessing as we go out. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the countenance of his face upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Now go forth and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.